I'm just going to start that now. Um, okay, great. Uh, so could I check that um, my panelists are here? Are you in here? Yes. I see Jessica. I believe we have one more judge. Yes, I'm here. Great. Um, and am I looking for, I think I'm looking for Evelyn. Okay, well, we'll hold on for a moment. Um, Is possible the draw was updated? I'm not seeing Evelyn's name on the draw anymore. Oh, let me uh, let me refresh. That's totally possible. You're right. You're you're absolutely right. Okay, great. Um, then in that case, uh, let's start with some quick introductions. Um, so my name's Matt. I'll be the chair. Um, happy to be judging this round. Uh, congratulations to both teams and welcome to round eight. Uh, if we could introduce ourselves, um, the judges, uh, just name, if you're interested, pronoun uh, in the order of the draw, that'd be awesome. Uh, hi, my name is Freddie. I use he or they pronouns. Let's have a good debate. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica and I'm on the panel. Congratulations on making it to the final round and I wish you all the best of luck for the round. Great, thanks. Um, if we could have the proposition team introduce themselves in speaking order. Hey. Yeah, so Vincent Gao is first prop and reply, uh, he, him. Uh, second speaker, Anushka, she, her. Third speaker, Max. Opposition. Speaking first for opposition, Mike Capilla. Speaking second, Maxwell De Lorenzo. Speaking third, Nick Brackow. And reply, Mike Capilla. Great, thanks. Um, haven't judged at this world schools yet, so let me know if I'm missing anything major procedurally. Uh, but uh, final reminder to teams, please speak to time. Um, if you speak past eight minutes 15, I will simply stop flowing. Um, I will not be sending time signals in the chat if there is anyone who like really needs time signals, let me know and we can try to figure something out. But I'm traditionally pretty terrible at doing that. Um, offer POIs, accept POIs, be good to each other and enjoy the debate. There are no further questions or concerns. Uh, I look forward to this round. I call this house to order and I'm happy to invite up the prime minister to begin the debate for proposition side here, here. Uh, just checking that I'm audible. And POIs in the chat, please. Um, I'll just accept them when I see them. Millions of ex-convicts serve a life sentence in the world of opposition. These are people who care about justly applying the laws that they were unjustly convicted by. Family members who care about their hometowns that see face police subjugation daily. And individuals who care about improving the police force but cannot in their world. These millions should not be barred by discrimination and stereotype. They should be free to live the lives beyond a sentence that they've already served. When punishment is levied outside the courtroom, every convict serves a life sentence. Um, proposition has two arguments to make in the first speech. Firstly, on ex-convicts themselves, and secondly, on reforming the force. But before that, what is our stance? Three points. Number one, we think it is likely that individuals with actively violent tendencies are filtered out through existing selection systems. This looks like psychiatric evaluation simulations that put applicants and non-convicts into stress situations. Training on de-escalation procedures, which we already have in place and mentioned, have increased in the aftermath of BLM. Basic background checks that see if an ex-gang member, for instance, is still in contact with their gang and their agency. Notably, a lot of this already exists for non-convicts, so we are supporting a continuation of the status quo. Second, when individuals are new to the job, and this also applies to non-convicts too, they're likely going to be put in low risk and low tier jobs, such as community outreach divisions or being a patrol or a regular beat cop until they get promoted. Beat cops are also often paired with senior officers, for instance. So in our world, there's already effectively a probationary period that screens for things like bad behavior, violent tendencies, and various reactions. Thirdly and finally, in terms of the people who are likely to apply, we think it will and largely be lower level criminals who engaged in crimes of accusation and nonviolent crime, 
largely because A, statistically, this is the most, the vast majority of crime. But second of all, if you were locked up uh, for decades uh, by the state because you engaged in violent crime, it's probably the case that you hate the police, you hate the government, and you don't want to join the police force to begin with. First argument then, excellent things. To begin, a principle. It is morally unjust for the state to punish ex-convicts who have already served their sentence and have been deemed fit to enter society and rehabilitate it. On an objective level, these are ex-convicts who have paid for their sins and crimes and suffered the consequences. This is a perpetual punishment that stays well beyond when a sentence ends. On a more nuanced level, however, we think that this is an excessive punishment that is disproportional. It's not just the case that these people have already paid for their sins. It's also the case that the vast majority of people engage in nonviolent crime that isn't that egregious, as petty as breaking a car window or drug dealing, for instance, especially in the United States, or crimes of acquisition and subsistence, which constitutes already uh, over half of crimes in most countries. More out, moreover, however, under the principle, it is often people of color in their world that are disproportionately punished, who are more likely going to be locked up who are more likely going to be served a guilty verdict, who are more likely going to be carted and overplaced on their set of house. So at the conclusion of this principle, this is a fundamentally unfair punishment. A four-year sentence should end after four years. It does not in the world of opposition. Second of all, it disproportionately affects low-level criminals, people of color, in which this policy is a massive overblown and it's not proportional to what exactly these people did and the crimes that these people committed. I'll take a peek off from it. Second of all, second part of the argument, this is just a good opportunity, a solid economic opportunity for ex-convicts. It's a well-paid job where you get insurance and social benefits and healthcare on the side for your children. It provides structure for ex-cons who are often overblown by things like crime and jail. It gives them meaning and purpose since they feel like they're actually contributing to society instead of staying in jail. This is especially important in the context where criminals are often blacklisted from other jobs because of their ex-con status in the world of opposition. So rather than re-offending or joining previous crime communities and circles and gangs out of no alternatives, this job brings people a paycheck and stability for the most vulnerable groups of minorities in the world. Before I go on, I'll take a peel. Would you allow sex offenders who have served their sentences to become teachers? Uh, no. Let's talk about reforming the force. A central issue with the police in the status quo is that there's a large empathetic gap between the average beat cop and the average convict. The police force is comprised of a body of people who never need to be in circumstances where they have to resort to crime. These are often financially stable white individuals or people of the ruling class who cannot empathize with a black teen in Chicago living in economic destitution. These are individuals who have stable families, stable financial circumstances, who don't have to engage with the other side. This empathetic and demographic gap maps onto other issues as well. When the average beat cop patrolling your community in the world of opposition knows about the lived circumstances of poverty and violence, they attribute bad behavior and violence to the person and not to the circumstance. This leads to a greater likelihood of that cop being violent. This individual and that white cop on their side of the house doesn't attribute bad behavior to the circumstance. They just believe that the individual, that black teen is bad in and of itself. In a high crime community where curfew is 10 p.m., a cop who has worked only one shift a day for their entire life because they have financial stability does not understand why a black man is coming home an hour after curfew late after the third and final shift. When the average union or board member on their side of the house is a 55-year-old white man, policies do not reflect circumstances on the ground. When your patrol partner brutally beats a Hispanic teen because they believe they are a drug dealer, you don't file a report since you have more empathy for your partner that you've worked with for 11 years rather than the Hispanic teen because you're a white man. We fix this issue in two key ways. The first thing to note is that people who join the force on our side of the house are likely going to have desires to reform the system. These are individuals who have been wronged by the police and the pact. Um, but second of all, there are plenty of ex-cons on our side of the house who are likely to join who are going to be people of color. This is true for two reasons. First, in high crime communities, people of color are often arrested the most to a disproportionate rate. Look at the United States, for instance, where in a number of inner city communes or in inner city areas, not communes, for instance, one in four black men are arrested and convicted and sentenced. For but the second reason why there are more people of color on our side of the house who are likely going to join the force is that non-convicts who are people of color often distrust the police because they know a family member who has been arrested, for instance, where they know that the police has historically been bad for their individual or group. What does this mean then? Um, it means that number one, empathetic ex-cons and people of color hold positions of power on our side of the house. These are individuals who can climb the force ladder, who can become regional union officials, who can become precinct captains and can make policy reforms, such as more stringent accountability measures for police that go out of line, which charges abusive officers and measures that enforce the wearing of body cams and more de-escalation training. Second of all, however, 
even if they don't get into positions of power. Having a presence in and of itself means that you can check what other people say and feel. If you're in a room with another black man, for instance, who is a cop, you're less likely to do things like uh, agent, uh, policy reforms that are racist, and you're less likely to do things like think before you speak. Moreover, it is just statistically better that we have more beat cops and patrols who relate to people on the ground. The weighing of this argument is simple. The background checks on our side of the house are likely going to be a fair approximation of who is allowed to get into our policy. It is unlikely that the most violent and the most psychiatrically mentally ill person is going to get through our policy and going to be screened by. But what is likely in our side of the house is that we have hundreds, maybe dozens in certain precincts of individuals who are actually empathetic to that person on the ground, who is able to relate to the black teenager in Chicago in inner suburbs of the United States because they've been in that circumstance and they know the realities of circumstances of crime and being extremely poor and living in economic destitution. This policy therefore, dramatically reduces the likelihood of police forces abusing their power, and we allow for individuals to be held accountable if it's a case that they abuse their power. When punishment is levied outside of the courtroom, every single convict lives a life sentence. We're very proud to propose. I thank that speaker for their speech. If the other judges are not ready, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm happy to call up the leader of opposition here, here. Can everyone hear me? Can people hear me? Great. Panel, this policy damages the effectiveness of the police force and the public's ability to trust in that effectiveness. For that reason, on Team England, we oppose two arguments in this speech. First of all, on why we are likely to get bad police officers under side proposition. Second, on how this damages public confidence in the police. And in the second speech, uh, my second speaker is going to talk about how this damages confusion within the police force and why that's so damaging. First, what's our stance on side opposition? We believe that we're happy to provide jobs for convicts. We think rehabilitation is important. The state itself can provide work to these people if they're good for it. The state motive isn't as high and we recognize the abilities there. They can work as firemen in public transport, utilities, maintenance, etc. These provide them with a means of living without the unique risk of making them police officers that side opposition wants to take on. And we are very happy to encourage them to make amends to the community in other ways or to use them as informants and get information from them in particular cases. We just don't think they should be employed to carry out the role of a police officer. What's our response then to the proposition case? So four main areas here. First of all, with their model, we're told that there's likely to be extensive screening of applicants to stop violent people getting into the system. First, this is purely an assertion. There's no explanation of why this is the case. But second line of response is that this screening doesn't work on non-convicts under the status quo. It's unclear how it's going to work for convicts. We think it's relatively easy to fake these things. There will always be individuals who slip through the cracks of the measures they correctly identify exist. For example, Wayne Cousin will go to. Second, on the principle, they only devoted about a minute to this, so I'm going to deal with it very quickly. The first line here is that these people have already paid for their sins. First, we already weigh the safety of innocent people to be more important. We think we have the existence of criminal records and those kinds of systems so that society can be protected. But second, they literally can see this entire line of their principle in a pure while when we ask, would you employ a pedophile to work in a school? Now, panel, you might think this is an extreme example, but note that the principle itself was incredibly extreme. There was no explanation of where we might impose restrictions on this principle or where it ought to be limited. Based on that, given that they completely conceded this example with no explanation, I think they're going to have to do a little more work if they want it to be relevant in this debate. But then they say this is a disproportional punishment. Frankly, we think this is an assertion, but we do believe on side opposition is completely proportional. We think if you've caused harm to others in the past, you shouldn't be allowed to cause more, more harm in the future. Third, on helping ex convicts we don't think this is exclusive to their side. The specific analysis they give can clearly apply to other jobs. So even to charity work specifically targeted at ex-convicts, it's unclear why stability and structure are exclusive to their side. This makes no sense. Fourth, on improving the system. We think that individuals who are empathetic to criminals or those who want to structurally reform the police are not going to be selected to join the force. We'll clash with this later, but note that this analysis is devastating to their case because they rest their entire case on this idea that the people who are going to be selected are going to be those who are very empathetic and are likely to make good changes. But we don't think this is true. 
First of all, we think it's unlikely that we're going to get lots of people of colour, for example, applying to join the police. If you saw your brother or father go to prison while the white man from the right side of town got off spot free, I think, frankly, you'll likely just want to avoid the police in the future. Otherwise, I don't think the US would have a police force dominated almost entirely by white men. But note what we'll be expanding on later in our case, and this is crucial. The police have clear incentives to discriminate. First, Prop says they'll have more people of colour, but they're likely to be discriminated against in the hiring process for the reasons proposition already gives. But crucially, the police force are only likely to want those who are never going to be perceived as soft on crime, those who are going to be the most zealous, those who are going to insist that other convicts pay for their sins so that they can avoid the kinds of reputational harms that because will be incredibly damaging. This ultimately leads to more brutality under their side. Our first argument then on why a significant like, number of ex-convicts are likely to make bad police officers. First question it was what is special about police officers? Why do we want to limit entries to this job specifically? We think police officers uniquely hold an immense amount of power. They can detain and arrest individuals. They hold a great deal of legitimacy. No individual should hold that unless we are certain that they are able to exercise that responsibly. If they make a mistake, justice isn't done. So one of the different groups of criminals who might apply and be selected. Note that this clash is with the incredibly simplistic stuff we get out of side opposition, which is these are nice people who are going to be sympathetic and now want to enforce the law. But let's engage with their best case. We think the ex-convicts who are most likely to sign up, who want to reform and enforce the law, are going to be those who are most likely to be overzealous and brutalistic. The reason is that these people have been through the system themselves. This means that they have seen firsthand the terrible things that criminals do every day in prison. They might be firsthand victims of crime themselves inside prison. And note that even if a wide variety of ex-convicts applied to these positions, even if the group's proposition talks about applied to these positions, the individuals most likely to be selected by the police are going to be the most zealous and violent and tough on crime, because the police force is going to be incredibly afraid of selecting ex-convicts who appear to be sympathetic towards criminals in case they end up being soft on crime and damaging the effectiveness or perception of the police force. They will not select the African-American man who tells them they need structural reform and to lose funding so they can give that to social workers. They're going to hire the white guy who was caught in a drug deal and is now out for revenge on the gangs he believes wronged him. But the second group is criminals who seem to have performed but actually haven't. Because aside from side proposition's assertion, we think it's actually very difficult to tell whether a criminal has truly become a better person. We think all of these individuals, no matter their incentives, have been proven to have criminal tendencies. In the past, they've decided to put their own interests in front of the law and morality, and they are therefore uniquely likely to do so again. We agree that the rehabilitation system right. in countries is currently extremely flawed, but note that this analysis itself come back to bite side proposition, because it means these ex-convicts are highly likely not to be reformed and therefore to do bad things or exercise poor judgment when they're in these positions. But even if these people only committed crimes of acquisition or desperation, note that our analysis still stands. They're clearly willing to put their own priorities above respecting the law. A lot of people are in bad circumstances, but we don't think that means that everyone necessarily resorts to crime. We think these are individuals who have shown that if they are put under pressures, they will likely be in situations while they're working in the police forces, they are willing to make this particular decision. And note the nuance here in our argument. We aren't saying that these are going to be people who are necessarily inherently bad or make bad decisions in every aspect of their life. So it is far more nuanced than that. We are simply saying that given every all the framing we gave you at the start of this speech about how police officers are in a unique position of power, their ability to do harm in these situations massively outweighs any marginal benefit side proposition might want to bring you from a couple of criminals being able to find jobs as police officers. We think the impact of this is that you either get massive brutality because that police force are only hiring people who are going to be overzealous and who are very afraid of being perceived as soft on crime, or you get people who are likely to have links to crime themselves, who are likely to make bad decisions or are likely to abuse that power. Before I go on to talk about public confidence in the police, sure. You say that experience with crime makes you more overzealous, but if your experience with crime is being a criminal, wouldn't it make you more sympathetic to being in no, your own- I think you've misunderstood our analysis here. Our explanation is that when you go into prison, you are very likely to become a part of a gang, you are likely to be a victim of a gang, you are likely to be a victim of further crime. You are likely to see the very worst things that criminals do to each other. This is going to be incredibly damaging because you perceive yourself as one of the good ones, one who has done their time and paid for their sins, but everyone else you perceive as bad because you've seen the worst of what criminals can do while you're inside prison. Second, on public confidence in the police. We think many people are just genuinely afraid of convicts because they have bad experiences. 
And if you know one convict, you've done something, or you've read a media story, you think they're all like that, you view them as one homogenous negative group. This massively harms trust if you implement this policy. I know this isn't contingent on the first point, the perception that convicts are untrustworthy exists regardless of how good they actually are. We think in addition, the media is likely to make this perception entirely worse. This is likely to be a controversial policy, so its implementation will be advertised and prominent in public discussion, and the media will sensationalize these stories and make it dramatic. But note that this damage just particularly impact on vulnerable groups like women. Now, when you're walking home alone on a dark street and you think someone might be following you, you are less likely to trust a police officer across the road because they could be a sex offender. Or if you're a member of an ethnic minority, you know that white supremacists supremacist ideology is uniquely powerful among white convicts because gangs are organized in prisons along racial lines. You're far more likely to fear the police, you're far less likely to report a hate crime. For all these reasons, so proud to oppose. I stopped flowing at 815. Um, I appreciate that speech. If the other judges are ready. All right. Happy to call up the Deputy Prime Minister if you're here. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, I'd prefer POIs verbally if that's possible. The Court of England's case relies on an unproven and somewhat unsavory assumption about who ex-convicts are and how they live their lives. According to first opposition, ex-convicts are overzealous and brutal. They're violent. They think a person convicted at the age of 19 for smoking marijuana or something trivial like that is somehow morally equivalent to a pedophile, according to their POI. Canada's characterization of ex-convicts by comparison was more realistic and more hopeful. That many of these ex-convicts were people who made unfortunate mistakes they were in the wrong place at the wrong time, in the wrong color of skin, and that many of these people wanted to make the world better, or at the very least, give themselves a better shot, a shot at a better life. Canada thought this was the least they would deserve. That is why we are proud to propose. I'm going to talk about four things in this speech. First of all, on who these ex comics are likely to be and what their incentives are. Second of all, I'll deal with the principled class in this round. Third, I'll talk about reforms to the police. And then fourth, I'll introduce a constructive argument on trust in law enforcement, which will directly respond to their second claim. On the first issue of who these convicts are, I think much of England's case relies on a mechanism about the hiring process for some reason selecting for bad hard on crime people, which is like fairly unsubstantiated. I'm actually unsure why it is that police units for some reason want to hire more violent people. We think it is far more likely that police units want to improve their legitimacy through hiring people who do not like uh, who, uh, who do not crack down or commit brutality. This is actively bad press. In the wake of George Floyd, many police units had funding rescinded in across the uh, across the Western world for committing acts of brutality. And this is an active reason as to why you would prefer people who are softer on crime. Also, because even to the extent that people within the police force might be somewhat, you know, have, have violent tendencies in the status quo for, for reasons they still don't explain, there are also other actors that have effects over the hiring process. So municipal governments, for instance, that participate in hiring processes of police officers, people who are police commissioners or at the top who have to meet targets for reducing brutality in much of the world. So these are all reasons as to why you are unlikely to pick the most deranged versions of the convicts. And even to the extent that you do, presumably you could have just found violent people who happen to not be convicts as well. And I'm actually unsure what the margin is here. And then they say prisons are really bad and there are things like gangs which convert you into becoming more violent. I think our stance largely dealt with this in the sense that we said the worst people are likely to be filtered out through things like psychiatric evaluations, through simulations, and even to the extent that they ended up in the police. We talked to you about how in the introductory stages of being a police officer, it is unlikely that they are put on incredibly high risk tasks such as facing an armed robbery. And it's more likely that at the beginning of your career, you're put in pairs with other police officers, you're forced to observe so that they can see how you, re you react to different situations. And so the worst apples are likely to be filtered out in our side. I don't think they sufficiently respond to that. We also just give you a number of other reasons, which I don't think get response as to why the majority of people who uh, are ex-convicts are nonviolent criminals to begin with, how many of them are from racialized group, uh, groups, how they're unjustly convicted. And I think second opposition speaker probably needs to deal with that. Secondly, then talking about the principled clash. 
Our claim from first was that this unjustly excludes the ex-convicts who had already been punished. I think they respond with examples and not analysis. They say, we already hold criminal records. Therefore, this means that we prioritize the safety of innocent people over people who are convicts. The first thing is that, obviously, like, like I think we broadly oppose job discrimination against people with criminal records. And secondly, they, they, they have this like pedophile example, which they repeatedly like use. Let's talk about how we decide whether this is more analogous to a job discrimination or like pedophile school teachers. The first difference between these cases is on the likelihood of harm. There's some possibility in any case of employment that an ex-convict is going to cause some degree of harm. So they say they would make the ex-convicts drive buses instead. There's probably some possibility that an ex-convict you know, harasses someone on a bus, for instance, or crashes a car. So thus, the question in this round is how likely you are in different situations to be relatively more violent. And I think in order for this to be analogous in any way to pedophiles, they need to prove an incredibly high threshold of increased violence, but I don't think they've done sufficiently in this round. The second is in the level of moral sympathy. There are probably just zero good reasons for being a pedophile and assaulting children. By comparison, there are many reasonable and, under, and comprehensible explanations for why people would commit crime. Even if we think crime is broadly bad, we talked to you about how in many countries, the, the framework for crime is unjust, that it, that it artificially punishes things like petty crime or like nonviolent drug consumption, which are not in reality moral crimes. We talked to you about racialization of crime. We got very little response. So that is why it's different from pedophiles. And notice the intuition behind this claim as well, that we should never deprive someone of opportunity for a significant just cause. It is true across most societies, for instance, that racial minorities are more likely to commit violent crime due to structural economic reasons and racial oppression. But it would be absurd to suggest as a result that we should bar Black people in the U.S from the police force or indigenous people in, Australians from, uh, in Australia from the police force, regardless of whether doing so would have marginal instrumental benefits because to bar someone from employment on an arbitrary basis distorts their dignity and entitlement to fair treatment in an unacceptable way. So this is why we went independently on the principle. Thirdly, in the speech then talking about um, the effects in, in terms of police calls. And I'm not spending a lot of time here because they don't really respond to a lot of the arguments we give you from first in terms of why this alters police culture on why the violent police culture festers due to the absence of the oppressed people in the room. The cops can make jokes about the criminals they've locked up. They can get away with harassment in interrogation rooms. In the police car, they can make racial assumptions and get away with it because you have no people who are from the relevant community who are represented in that situation. Secondly, we talked to you about racial composition, the fact that people from oppressed communities tend to have less internalized biases and tend to be more understanding towards those from their racial groups. And that in communities where the, the proportion of people who have where ex-convicts within a specific racial group is high, We're talking about a quarter of people in some Black communities in the U.S., it is likely to significantly alter the racial composition of police in a way which negatively affects their ability to execute justice fairly. Before I talk about my constructive argument, I'm happy to take a point at this one. Who is a police officer who's been shot at by criminals more likely to employ? A Black man who earnestly says there are structural problems with the police, or a man who says he hates all criminals and won't hesitate to pull the trigger? Um, so I don't think there is a binary between those two. We think there are like, A, I think I already responded to this when I talked to you about the incentives to reduce things like brutality. And there are probably people in between who are just generally dislike the effects that crime has on the community because they've been through that community and yet think that there is an ability of people in high crime communities to do good. On the third argument about how this improves trust in the police, and I'll just flag at the top of this directly response to their like minute long second argument on public confidence. One Enforcement is impeded not only by its own misconduct, but by the perception that it is punitive and foreign, that it is an external force designed to compromise harmony within communities. We reduce this perception in prop in two ways. The first is through microscopic interactions that you have with the police. Police spend quite a lot of time with ordinary people. They visit schools and talk about their stories in many cases. They sit in coffee shops alongside families and children, and they know people in their personal lives. So when you think of the police, now you think of your neighbor, George, who's from the same high crime area as you, rather than like Derek Chauvin. This means that people are exposed to a new version and conception of the police. They are conscious that these are the people who have walked through the same streets, people who have made the same mistakes, and people who have lived in the same cramped cells and prison hallways. On a macroscopic level, it means that the police are more racially similar to high crime communities that they police, as we point out earlier in first. That keeping these people out of, out of the police meaningfully tilts the racial composition of the police towards white privileged people who have very little in common and very little personal connection with the communities that they police. And the important implication is that trust precedes full engagement with law enforcement. It is scary for a woman of color experiencing domestic violence or a black kid in the US who is mugged on the street to speak to a force that they see as oppressive towards their community and as an inadequate. A sense of personal connection bridges this gap and because it means that you have the belief that the officer will not be judgmental towards you, that you have some common ground upon which you can connect. 
This means that more victims of crime receive justice and hope in our world. And even on their metric of saving innocent people, we are far more likely to, get to have people have justice delivered towards them after the fact. In opposition, these people are left fearful and silent to speak out. We think that is far worse. When punishment is levied outside the courtroom, every convict serves a lifetime sentence. We're incredibly proud of this. I thank that speaker for their speech. The other judges are ready. I'm happy to call up the deputy leader of opposition to continue the case for opposition side here, here. Am I audible? Don't let props slander us. We aren't assuming things about criminals. We are assuming things about the kinds of criminals who are going to sign up to this and the kinds of criminals who are going to be accepted. We never made assumptions, we gave you incentives. First on top of the principle, then on who is likely to sign up and be accepted and why they're gonna make the system worse. Then I wanna talk about trust in the system and finally on why you hurt cohesion within the police force. First on the principle, three responses to this. A, we can hire these people in other ways. If the important thing is that we give them opportunities, ultimately we can provide alternative opportunities that do not have the same level of societal risk. We can make them firefighters. We can employ them in public transport for utilities. Second response, Prop 2 conceded this class was dependent on the practical. She conceded in the cases where the risk is sufficiently high that ultimately we don't need to hire these people. I'm gonna prove why that risk is going to be high on their side in the next class. Third of all, on the idea of unfair imprisonment, the point here is that if certain people are imprisoned unfairly, the solution to this isn't to like abolish all prisons. The, the point is to, the solution presumably would be to eliminate the points of unfairness. Therefore, the idea that people are unfairly treated at one point down in the criminal justice system doesn't mean that everything all down the line should be affected. It means you should improve that specific component of it. Therefore, the principle is not in the debate. First of all, on who is likely to sign up, I want to take out the idea of the two groups of people who they think are likely to sign up. One, they think people of color are going to sign up and be accepted. We think this is wrong because as proposition told you, the police force is likely to be quite racist, which means they're likely to discriminate against those individuals. Prop gave you that analysis. Second of all, they say the people who sign up are going to be the ones who want to reform the system. That's wrong. If you're an individual who was victimized by the police in the past, you don't want to join the police because you hate the police and you hate police officers. You don't want to go into your job every day and have to work with those people. You don't want to cooperate or be subjugated by the system because the chance of you improving the system is incredibly small because you are a cog within a massive, massive machine, which means people who want to reform the system or who have been victimized by the police have no incentive to sign up. On the let's respond to the things they told you about. First of all, they say, well, there's external influence, things like municipal bodies, and that ultimately they have incentives to appear legitimate. The problem is twofold. First of all, Black Lives Matter is a minority movement, and ultimately the most powerful people in communities, I, those who are most likely to be relatively wealthy and privileged, are ones who want to be tough on crime, which means there are incentives to not be soft on crime, but ultimately to employ those people who are going to be relatively zealous. Secondly, even if you have some kind of external influence, police unions are incredibly powerful and are likely going to demand a huge amount of power over the system. The next thing they say, Anushka says is, well, what's the margin? On both sides of the house, they're going to be hiring relatively zealous people. The, the point is the degree to which they're likely to be zealous and abusive. On our side of the house, you might hire police officers who are somewhat privileged and who vaguely dislike crime. But on their side of the house, you're going to be hiring people with personal reasons to be incredibly hateful towards criminals. That is to say, they're likely to despise criminals and to want to crack down on them as much as possible. What is the reason for this? The reason is the point at which individuals go into prison, the biggest threat to you is not the criminal justice system. The biggest threat to you is other criminals. It's other criminals who are likely going to force you into joining a gang. Other criminals who are most likely to make you a victim of prison rape. Other criminals who are likely to murder or threaten you, which means your biggest source of personal hatred is towards other criminals. These are people who are going to sign up and they're likely to be significantly more zealous and abusive than ordinary people you might hire elsewhere. That is crucial. We think therefore, at the end of the day, the police aren't going to be hiring moderates. They're going to be hiring the ones who are victims of drug deals and therefore want to be incredibly harsh 
on drug crime. The next thing they say is, well, they're going to filter these people out. We told you this is impossible for the two reasons my gave you that were not responded to. A, you just can't read someone's mind, so it's unclear how this works. But B, this filtering clearly doesn't work in the status quo, given the extent of abuse we already see. So it's unclear how they're going to be able to apply it to, crim to criminals. The, the, finally, we think ultimately the people who are most likely to sign up and be promoted within the criminal justice system are going to be the ones who are harshest on crime. These are the ones who are going to be making the hiring and firing decisions, which is an additional reason why these people are likely to be bad. So therefore, in the best case scenario, individuals who are likely to genuinely to have been genuinely reformed are likely to be significantly more abusive than ordinary police officers. But let's talk about the second group, which wasn't engaged with. We think ultimately the rest of convicts, convicts that they hire, you open the risk to other forms of abuse. That is to say, it's incredibly difficult to screen individuals. And we think these people may not be fully trustworthy, even they've proven to have some kind of criminal proclivities, i.e. they put the law before themselves. These are two unique groups of people. Both of them are worse than ordinary police officers. The second clash is on the idea of the perception of the police and criminals. Their argument is that it's good to have relatively accessible people who you can engage with. Two responses. A, as Mike explained to you, the dominant prevailing narrative is that convicts are stigmatized broadly in the status quo because they're viewed as a threat to the fabric of society. The second thing is, even in these minority areas, if there are incentives for the police to appear legitimate, then they can hire certain minority policemen on our side of the house. The difference is whether you hire minority individuals who have hurt that community by engaging in crime. Thus, we think that because you as a potential member of the public cannot tell which people were convicts and which policemen were not convicts, you're likely to distrust convicts as a whole, given the extent to which crime hurts these people on a daily basis. Therefore, we think the most vulnerable people, i.e., for example, women who might be subject to, for example, sexual abuse, are ultimately going to be less likely to be able to or to feel confident in calling upon the resources of the state, given that they're likely to tar this the entire brush. And the reason is, the, a media story saying that police officers, like ex-convicts do their job well, isn't a big story. But if a single ex-convict abuses their position, it's likely to be heavily publicized, given the stigma against convicts, which means you massively increase stigma towards the police. I'll take a few away. So I think you basically engage exclusively with cases of violent crime. But why should a person who commits like a drug crime when they're pretty young, serves a few yeah. months and then yeah. doesn't yeah. join the gang? No, 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 no. no I, I gave you this example, right? If you did a drug crime, that means you were a victim of drug dealing, which means you are likely to despise drug dealers and the effects they had in your community, which means you're going to be incredibly harsh on drug crime. Okay, I gave you that example. So why does this hurt cohesion within the police force? We think cohesion is incredibly crucial in the police. The police need to be able to work together to enforce the law because it's an intense job where trust is crucial. During an investigation, when you're in a high pressure situation, your life will depend upon your coworkers and given that you need to be making very quick decisions. Why is there likely going to be mistrust here? We think the police are likely going to have a general hatred towards and prejudice towards conflicts. Sorry, convicts. We the police are likely to be going to be individuals who hold a relatively high principled view of the law and are likely to dislike those who break it. But also, we think the police are likely to associate ex-convicts with the people who put their lives in danger every single day. The, the final reason why these people are likely to be mistrusted within the police force is that they have proven poor judgment and that therefore are likely to, have, to be perceived to have associations with crime. The point here is that this takes out a lot of the proposition case, because a lot of the proposition case suggests that these convicts might get promoted. They might do well in the system. They'll be able to convince other police officers to do well, but that's not going to happen at the point where they're likely to be mistrusted, they're likely to be ostracized. In fact, that's the reason why these convicts are likely to be even more overzealous, because they need to do an overly aggressive job in order to gain the trust of their other police co-workers in order to be perceived as someone who is not a criminal and therefore wants to be uh, someone who is harsher on crime. At the end of the day, Black Lives Matter is not a mainstream movement. The most powerful people in communities have incentives to push the police to be harsh on crime, which means the police are likely to hire individuals who are going to be harsher than ordinary police officers. That's our margin. We're proud to oppose. Okay, thank that speaker for their speech. If other judges are ready, happy to call up the GovWhip. Hello, can you hear me? Great, um, I'll take verbal POIs. I'll start in three, two, one. 
Opposition's case and almost all of their material rely on psychological assertions of possible reactions to experiences in prison, of possible reactions to experiences in the workplace, and of possible reactions from the community. What they never give you are structural and analytical reasons as to why our best case scenario, which we frame from the top, is the consistent with most forms of crime, is a bad thing on our side of the house. When punishment is levied outside the courtroom, every convict serves a life sentence. Two themes in this speech. Firstly, on convicts, and then secondly, on policing. And I want to talk about our principal first year because it receives very, very poor engagement. The first thing they say um, in their second speech is that you can hire like criminals to other jobs. So clearly they don't have fiat to do this. So they have to convince you and give you some likelihood analysis as to why convicts are likely to access these jobs. They give you no such analysis, so you shouldn't count this point anyway. But let me give you some reasons why it's unlikely they hire for other jobs. The first thing to note is that police is a uniquely undesirable job, right? It's hard, you're walking the beat, you're risking your life, you're putting a lot on the line when you're a police officer. That's not true of firefighters and it's not true of public transport drivers, which are the examples they give. And that means that convicts have a unique advantage when applying to police jobs because they don't have to compete with average people who also want jobs. So we think it's unlikely that people are able to get jobs with the state. We, have to, we think convicts are unlikely to get jobs with businesses because it just looks really, really bad for those businesses. The second thing to note about these jobs, as Anushka points out and they never deal with, is why it's better to have like a convict as a like public transport driver who's alone with a woman on a bus at night, why that same distrust and that same potential for abuse doesn't exist on their side. So this response doesn't make any sense. The second thing they say is this is hinged on practical risk. And then they kind of give a third response that says you should specifically improve the unfairness of the system. And these are linked together because essentially what they're saying here is whichever side proves a more apt solution to unfairness in the system as opposed to genuine guilt is the side that wins this debate. And I just want to note here that on opposition, it is their solution that is general. Because if you look at the motion, they're disallowing all all convicts, not just murderers, not just rapists, not just people who did assault, all convicts from working in the police force. But it is obvious in this round that not every convict shares a same level of responsibility. And some convicts obviously have no responsibility for their crimes at all, given that some innocent people are convicted. And so if you recognize that fact, you just have to consider if we would do what they are proposing to do in any other situation in life. Would we prohibit every single African American from working in the police force because they are slightly more likely than other populations to be criminals? Of course we wouldn't, because we're punishing innocent people who did nothing wrong or did very little wrong to protect the community from a few bad offenders. And so principally we think, our principal stance, right? We should weigh the right of these people to work these jobs, to not be discriminated against, not to be treated unfairly over even some minor or even slightly significant harms to social safety. So we think we prove our principle and their responses do not stand there. Secondly, then, under the theme of convicts, on jobs and the comparative. And I think this is another important theme. So we tell you why being a cop is a uniquely good job on our side of the house. I've already dealt with why there are no comparative jobs. But I think this also deals with a lot of their constructive material on abuse. Because the question they never ask in their speeches is, what are people, even in their best case, what are these overzealous people who hate the state and hate other criminals likely to do if they can't become cops, right? What's the comparative? Well, these people are already criminals. They're violent criminals as characterized by opposition. And it seems pretty intuitive that maybe they just keep doing crime. I mean, they don't have access to good jobs as they're framed. They don't have access to prestige. They don't really have a way to make a better life. Nobody's trained them out of their anger issues. Maybe they just do crimes. Why is it better that these people are on the force even if our worst case? Firstly, because they access a steady income. Secondly, because we give them a sense of purpose at the point at which we give them a steady job. Thirdly, because there's a degree of accountability and monitoring that comes with being a cop. You have a partner, you have supervisors watching over you. And fourthly, because we give you psychiatric and de-escalation training that can help manage anger issues that often plague violent criminals. And so we think on our side of the house, even in their very best case, where they do get these violent offenders on the force and they aren't screened out, we prove a better comparative because we'd rather these people be under watch than be out on the street. I'll take a PUI before I move on. Given this is a policy motion, we can have the fiat to introduce an alternative and hire these people in other public services, utilities, et cetera. Yeah, so we I, can why not if they in first, not in third op? What is this? Second theme then on policing. Firstly, on policing reform, we give you a lot of structural mechanisms that are pretty poorly engaged with on their side. They essentially give you a bunch of psychological counter assertions. So the first and key mechanism in their case is that people who are criminals are overzealous against other criminals because they go to prison and they get hurt. So the first thing we note down bench is this applies in a select number of circumstances, namely when A, these people have actually been victimized by other criminals, which is by no means the case in every situation. Secondly, when they value that victimization more highly than their victimization by the state that imprisoned them. And 
And thirdly, when the specific way that victimization plays out in the real world is like this weird act of taking revenge on other criminals in some sort of punisher fantasy. We think this is incredibly unlikely to affect the majority of cases, and the analysis we give you is much structurally more reasonable. What is our analysis? Very simple. If you are a criminal, you understand what drives people to crime. If you understand what drives people to crime, you naturally understand other criminals. And when you have understanding for someone, you are more sympathetic towards them inherently. This is a simple mechanism that applies in all cases. In the majority of crimes of acquisition, of non-lineal offenders, of drug offenders, of innocent people, most people who commit crimes, this logic applies to. We think we outweigh them on that point. And we think we do access our benefits of better policing here, right? We say these people have more empathy for other criminals they encounter on the street. It's harder for an us versus them mentality to form when you have somebody who has been on both sides of the aisle in the convict world and the police world. A lot of bad police encounters, in fact, the worst police encounters where things escalate are caused by this us versus them mentality. That's not something they ever sufficiently respond to on their side. Now they do say, and for some reason, no POC or empathetic people will ever be hired by the police force. And I just think this is ridiculous. The first thing to note is they make this assumption throughout their case that like you come to a job interview and you're like, I want to structurally reform the police force. I don't think that's an interview question that's ever asked. I think it's probably you hire people generally based on skills and maybe some reformers get on the police force uh, and that's fine. The second thing they say is that in the cases where criminals did crimes, they're just always likely to be worse police officers than the status quo. But we think that's just untrue, right? Even though they say, they try to frame that like small offenders still committed crimes that they think they're above the law. We think there are a lot of other compelling reasons to make crimes. You're economically desperate. You made a mistake. Maybe you legitimately changed as a person. All of these things, structurally factor in why they're not likely to be worse than the average person responding to situations. And then we give you additional characterization on why they understand criminals better and perception improves. And let's talk about perception briefly then. Well, what do we say in our perception argument? It's specific and clear. The community that you are a part of, the high crime community, sees you as a police officer rather than Derek Chauvin. You are more representative and you have personal contact and relationships with criminals rather than being this sort of outside force that's imposed on a community. And so we think the actual community you are policing leasing is more likely to trust you. So even if they prove some of their perception stuff, which is kind of silly, they don't prove a tipping point because cops only operate in the community that they're actually in. So only trust of the cops within a community matters. Argument specific, theirs is very general. Why does their perception argument not stand though? I don't think it's a tipping point for most people for calling the cops. If you think the cops have like some criminals, because you're probably more scared of the crime. The difference on our side is years and years of police abuse, which needs to be overcome, not this new policy that just came out yesterday. We think finally, I've been engaging with their best case throughout the whole speech. But we give you very convincing reasons and stance why bad people can't join the force to begin with. You have to take psyche valves. You have to do live fire training that tests your reaction and your discrimination. You have to have background checks. You have a probationary period. You have a partner. You dig low risk jobs initially. There's checks, checks at every single step of the way to prevent bad people from accessing these systems. And so we think even though we win on the best characterization and the best case that OP gives us, something they never do the charity of engaging with on their side, we actually prove a big likelihood why these criminals never join the force to begin with. And in that situation, we clearly win this round. So for those reasons, please, please vote for all. I think that speaker for their speech. The other judge is ready. I'm happy to call the opposition whip. You're here. Hi, am I audible and visible? Perfect, thank you. I'll take your eyes verbally, please. When the police are interviewing candidates to join the force, they're not going to employ the black man who earnestly explains how his own poor upbringing led him to be forced into crime and how the police force needs to be reformed if we're going to have better practical outcomes for everyone. They want to know that when they're in a firefight with a drug dealer, they want to know that you're going to not hesitate to pull the trigger. You're going to be tough on crime because those criminals are evil and have shot at their friends. That's what this debate was about and Canada refused to engage with that. 
Three points of clash then in this speech. Firstly, on rehabilitation of convicts. Secondly, on who gets better policing. And finally, on trust in the police. First of all, on the rehabilitation of conflicts. And I'm starting with this, because I think it is the least important clash in this debate, and it's very quick to resolve to our side. The main problem with Canada's analysis here is that we are never given a reason why the only way we can rehabilitate these people is by letting them join the police. The first thing they say is that this is a solid economic opportunity for people who are low-level criminals or people of colour, and we'd rather them have this job than re-effect. I'm not sure why this is the only job that they are able to do, which gives them money in order to improve their life. What's their response to this claim? Because we raised it earlier. They say, well, you can't get any other jobs because everyone hates convicts, everyone's scared of them, and they're untrusted. Hang on, panel. I want to point out here that this contradicts with their later analysis when they say that they're going to massively improve trust in police because somehow everyone loves convicts and feels safe when they're patrolling the streets. But secondly, we think in the same way that Prop has to be apt to allow these people to apply for police jobs, we can let them apply for other public service jobs. We pointed this out at the beginning of Maya's speech as the first point in our stance, and we pointed out again in APOI, at which point they concede that this does indeed take out their analysis here. And all they can say is that we didn't mention this in first, so we can't be at it in third. Now, either Canada were not listening to Maya's speech panel, or they are trying to mislead you. Either of those is not enough to win them this debate. Secondly, they try to tie this into a principle. They say that they've served their sentence and they've paid for their sins, and therefore we can't continue to restrict them. We just don't think this is empirically true. We think we regularly convict, but we, we continue to have restrictions on convicts throughout their lives. This is why we have criminal records. This is why we don't let sex offenders work in schools. And they accept that obviously we should restrict some convicts to some extent. They just say we need to prove a high amount of harm in order to restrict them. Recognize that in saying that, they can see that this principle is entirely practically contingent. So I'm not sure why then in the next sentence, they say that they're able to win independently on it. But we think that this does have a massive amount of practical harm. We think giving them a gun, letting them represent the government, putting them in a position where there is massive trust placed in them is obviously a massive risk, which we are not willing to take. And we don't think it matters if they were forced into this crime out of necessity, because many people are in poverty and they do not turn to crime. And no panel that their final genuinely quite insulting response to this is to say that this is morally equivalent to banning black people from the police force. We don't ban black people from the police force because that is racism. We ban convicts because they present more risks to the force. Well, that is obviously not morally equivalent. We think then we clearly take out their principle and show why their analysis doesn't stand. But let's talk about who gets better policing, because this is the most substantial clash of the debate. Firstly, they talk about reforming the force. They say that these people understand the reality of life and they're going to be sympathetic, they're going to be less harsh, and this leads to structural reform in the police. Their first response is that we tell you that, the, that instead, the people who are likely to get these jobs are going to be the ones who are overzealous, who appear tough on crime, who have the same attitudes as the police officers in their interview. Their first response is to say, not all convicts are those overzealous people. That's crazy psychoanal psychoanalysts, so psychoanalysis from Team England. Let me be abundantly clear here, panel, because every one of us has responded to this, and I can only assume that Canada are willfully misunderstanding. It may be true that many ex-convicts are not overzealous. It may even be true that most ex-convicts are not overzealous. Take a second to note this down. Our burden was to show that the ones who apply to join the police and the ones who are accepted by the police are going to be the ones who are overzealous. And note that this doesn't mean they're violent criminals. It means that they've been exposed to violent crime. It means that they hate the violent criminals that they met while in prison. And the reason why they want to join the police force is to do something about it. They say in response that police forces don't have the incentive to employ someone who appears harsh on crime. Three responses here. I want you to take a second to think how counterintuitive this claim is. The role of the police is to clamp down on crime. Obviously, they want to employ someone who will clamp down on crime. And we think this very much is a question that is asked in your interview because it directly relates to how good you are at your job. Secondly, note that simply asserting that Black Lives Matter happened doesn't mean now that the police are trying to employ someone who, in Canada's own words, are soft on crime. We think the police force is dominated by people who have spent their entire lives fighting crime, who have been shot at by criminals, who believe that criminals are evil people who cannot be allowed to continue offending. This is the prevalent culture within the police force, not that Black Lives Matter and that the police needs to reform. And recognize that that is the exact structural reason that police brutality is a problem in the first place. 
But I want you to recognize, panel, that even if the incentives to cut down on police brutality do exist among police officers, they probably prioritize their own safety over the idea of improving the force. Because even if they believe that racism is bad, they are much more worried about employing someone who may be soft on crime, or who may not pull the trigger when you're under threat. This is a much more pressing issue for them, and something that they're much more likely to consider highly when they're interviewing you. But I want to be charitable, because Canada never worked. Let's take them at their best case and say they do get the job. Even if they do, once you're on duty with another officer, someone who isn't a convict, and to take their own example, you see a black man walking home after curfew, what did Canada really think happens? Because when the ex-convict says, actually, maybe we shouldn't pull this man over, I'm sure he's not doing anything bad, or he gets angry at his colleague for being too harsh on him, the biases of his colleague are reinforced, and this person is likely to be dismissed or never promoted in the force in the first place. That means their nebulous impacts of them getting to the top of the police force and changing policy never stand in this debate. Finally, though, if you don't buy any of that, I'm not sure why this is the only route for these people to reform the police. I mean, they can get into charity work. They can do many other things in social services, which can also lead to this change. This rebuttal is important. This was their most substantial point, which they spent the bulk of their case on. And we show why their analysis is incredibly yeah, and our characterization is much more realistic. Before I go on, I'll take up your line. Sure. So maybe there's some initial suspicion of officers hiring these people, but there's six month probationary periods and training periods where you can form direct personal relationships and you don't have to rely on these stereotypes. Yeah. Why do they During that time, you have an incentive to appear as strong on crime as possible, because that's what the people above you want to do. We think that is exactly why they're going to be harsh on crime. But also those are the people most likely to apply for these jobs in the first place. We told you there are two groups of ex-convicts likely to get jobs. The ones were the overzealous ones. And note, we think these groups are the most persuasive ones. These are the people who are being overly harsh, who are more willing to pull the trigger when it is unnecessary. You get all of the bad impacts that the proposition wants to talk about. But the second group is those who have not reformed. They know that they never respond to the damn damning impacts of letting these people in who are actively detrimental to policing. They never engage with this because they believe their case directly clashed with it. But given that we've shown that our characterization of these ex convicts is more realistic, we win on the most important clash of who gets better police. Finally, on trust in the police. I've already pointed out that they contradicted their analysis earlier, so I'm not sure how much more I need to do here. But let's talk about which of our claims is more plausible. They say that people will see there are convicts in the police force, and so people are going to trust them more because people relate to convicts. We say people are much more likely to fear convicts, and that fear will be imprinted on the police. The only analysis they give for their claim is that people currently believe that police are separate and they have no common ground. I'm not sure why you need the police officer to be a convict to change this. Why can't you have a police officer who just grew up in the same neighborhood as you, and then you also get these impacts of relating to them? But in contrast, we told you you're much more likely to be afraid. Why is this more likely? Because firstly, it plays into the other societal narratives about criminals, because everywhere else in life, you're told to fear these people. And because secondly, the media are likely to sensationalize these issues, which make you more afraid than you should be. That means on balance panel, when you're working out which interpretation is more likely, you must side with opposition. Panel, we think we show why we are likely to damage trust in policing, where you get worse policing, and why they lose on principle, incredibly proud to oppose. I think that speaker for their speech, again, stopped flowing at um, 15 seconds. Uh, if the other judges are ready, I'm happy to call up the opposition reply. You're here. Can everyone hear me? Panel, a policy that increases police brutality and destroys public trust will never be the way towards a better or more rehabilitative justice system. That's why we're so proud of those. A couple of things in this speech. First question on characterization and second on trust. But first of all, I want to deal with Team Canada's principle, just to make it clear that it's out of this debate. In first, we gave specific responses to the two lines of principled analysis we get. These were never engaged with, and it was simply asserted down the bench that this was an independent path to victory. Why is that not the case? First, because the principle of helping ex convicts has to be balanced against other principal considerations. That's why Team Canada are happy to agree that sex offenders shouldn't become teachers. So, what is the actual weighing here between these principles? Because we were very clear, but side proposition doesn't give any. We tell you in first that the safety of innocent people and their access to justice is more important than the specific and sacred right to become a police officer. 
Then we tell you in the other, this principle quickly unravels because it's clearly practically contingent. This is just the principle of making life better for ex-convicts. If there's massive backlash, harms to justice and harms to the perception of ex-convicts, but it spills into every area of life and hurts their job prospects everywhere, this principle is clearly irrelevant. And second on rehabilitation, we've made it clear throughout this debate that we have equal fiat to provide alternative jobs, which provide stability and security without, as we framed in first, giving them the chance to cause immense and unique harm. First question then on characterization. Our burden on side opposition was never to prove that all or most ex-convicts are likely to be bad people or to exercise poor judgment. Team Canada's characterization of ex-convicts, the reasons why they commit crime, the way they're treated by the criminal justice system, is very sympathetic and it's very compelling and it might even be true, but it was never a relevant clash in this debate. Our burden was to prove that ex-convicts likely to apply to and be selected by the police are not likely to be ethnic minorities keen on changing the racial composition of the police force or earnest former shoplifters who want structural reform or anyone who wants to make life better for criminals generally. First on racial diversity, the police force is likely to be incredibly racially discriminatory in its hiring practices just as it is under the status quo, so racial composition is clearly symmetric because that discrimination takes place either way. That argument is out. But let's talk about what these individuals are likely to be like on a personal level. First, in terms of who applies to these jobs. Second, who is selected by the police force. You don't apply if you've been a victim of discrimination or police brutality in the justice system, because you're scared of that system. You don't want to work with these people every day of your life. And even if you want to see change, you don't think your sacrifice will mean you personally change the course of the system. But even if you do, the police force don't select you as an officer because these institutions are averse to change and they want to keep the status quo, which is why we don't have structural reform right now, but also because they know there'll be huge backlash if they select anyone likely to be biased or soft on crime. So they pick the individuals likely to be the most zealous and the most brutal. Note that the response of, but the police have strong incentives to avoid allegations of brutality doesn't apply either. Because as we explained in third, people view the role of the police as exercising force on behalf of the state, so they're likely to be willing to give the police the benefit of the doubt when they use excessive force in a difficult situation, but not when a convict, playing into every other negative societal narrative about criminals, commits another crime or lets another criminal get away. Therefore, the incentive to avoid allegations of being soft on crime massively outweigh the incentive to avoid allegations of police brutality. And even if you are fired, as we talk about in third, you are pressured by your colleagues into being overzealous to prove your loyalty. And note the comparative here, you are far more likely to have incentives to be overzealous as opposed to non ex convicts. And that doesn't just last a six month probationary period panel, it lasts your whole career because people will always be suspicious for reasons that side proposition concedes. So you get far more brutality than under the status quo because there are extra pressures and extra scrutiny that side proposition is so proud of in their very fine model. But note that they never engage with our characterization of the group that might not be overzealous, but might make bad choices, that might exercise poor judgment. We think that's also important. And finally, on trust, we think if we prove our characterization, we think this is in fact independent of this group of this argument, but it was never responded to. The side proposition never explained to us why we get better trust. They simply asserted that it isn't a tipping point, but given that their own analysis relies on this being a tipping point, I think for the debate to take place, they have to accept that this argument stands, and crucially that this policy massively damages the trust of our groups, holding the police, and therefore the ability to access justice. For all those reasons, so proud to have Great, I thank that speaker for their speech. The other judges are ready. Happy to call on the government reply speaker to conclude this debate, here, here. The strategy of Team England in this debate was to characterize everyone in the police force as evil, violent, and overzealous, and point to that as a mechanism and reason on why these ex-cons will be evil, violent, and overzealous as well. This was absurd for three reasons that we told you. Number one, in Anushka, we told you it's untrue. The police isn't great, but they won't just violently commit brutality and abuse individuals. Anushka gave you a host of incentives out of self-preservation, out of perceptions, out of local backlash, especially after the wake of BLM on why this is untrue. Second, we told you that this is not every single police force. Not every single police force and justice system exists out of the US. There are more reasonable interpretations of police that they need to engage with. Thirdly and finally, this is important. Even if this incentive to hire overzealous people were to be true, opposition could just hire regular, non-convict, violent people who, by the way, don't go through our additional screening processes that we've established in our stance. So England, therefore, needed to debate in a non-extremist real world. It is not true that the police overtly and deliberately hires violent people. 
that is impossible in the real world where individuals are realists. Brutality happens because of subconscious biases, stressful situations, and a lack of checks and balances, reasons that we gave you in force, not because the police purposely hires insane uh, and violent people. Let's talk about why individuals deserve this policy. Our principle was simple. Ex-cons who are often petty criminals and people of color and vulnerable individuals should not be additionally punished by this policy. They say in response, other jobs such as firefighters, which is by the way, an abuse of fiat will be available, which dodge the principle. The moral sin that we characterize stems from this particular job being barred and stolen from you as an ex-con. It's independent of other jobs and other economic situations being available. If I refuse to hire a woman at my bakery because I'm deeply sexist, she could be a firefighter, she could be a police, she could work at a grocery store, but it is still wrong because it is a principal and moral unjust sin. The better response that they give is that public safety is more important. This is inefficient. In Max, we told you that we wouldn't ban black people even though they're statistically and historically more likely to be violent. Nick responds in third, he says, we don't because it's racism, like come on, like we can call this prisonerism, right? You're mistreating two bodies of people because they did something in the past. But also we told you in our principle that this is also racism because people of color are disproportionately convicted as well. Lastly, we told you that these people need this job. It gives them economic security, social services, a sense of purpose when otherwise they might return to a life of crime. The weighing of this argument was massive. The relative comparison that you have to make is this. Maybe there are some violent criminals who slip through our 17 screening tests and partner system, but there are more ex-cons on their side of the house who live in economic destitution, who could possibly reoffend, who could return to a life of crime, return to their community circles, which are probably gangs, for instance. So this policy, therefore, was deeply unjust. Who are these ex-convicts then? The opposition portrayal of these ex-convicts that get accepted is that they are violent and overzealous. This is a direct quote. Why was this portrayal a lie? First of all, we told you that the vast majority of crimes are nonviolent, such as petty theft and crimes of subsistence. These people are not inherently violent and violent to the core. They're poor. They live in high crime areas. They're a person of color. Second, the minority of violent ex-cons remaining are likely going to be filtered out of our selection system. The white man who experiences a deep desire to crack down on gangs, their example at minute 615 of the leader of opposition speech, is likely to be filtered out for the same reason why a pedophile in our side of the house won't be accepted to teach. They say that the police is indirect and they want to accept violent and adversarial individuals, which we already said was absurd in our intro. Last of all, though, we just told you that these individuals were more empathetic. It was a very, very simple mechanism. If you're a drug dealer in the United States, it's probably the case that you resorted to selling drugs to put food on the table. It was absurd for second opposition to claim that you hate all drug dealers because of the experience. Maybe you were coerced into dealing drugs, but if anything, we told you that you understand other people because they were also in the system of coercion as well. So on our side of the house, we get more people of color and empathetic individuals hired. These are union officials and beat cops and patrol managers who mandate the wearing of body cams, who actually put in place checks and balances systems and let a black teen walk past without carting them or putting them in the back of their rope. When punishment is levied outside of the courtroom, every single convict serves a lifetime sentence. Great, um, I thank that speaker for their speech. Um, now, if the judges uh, could all move to, let's say, prep room one. Um, Yes, uh, 14A, I guess, uh, and we can chat there. Or no, sorry, I guess prop, prep room 14. No, okay, 14A, 14A works. All right, thanks, um, and we'll see you all soon. Thank you thanks so much. very much for the debate, Canada. Thanks so much. See you later. Uh, so we're pretty cringe, and we have the Instagram page, so do you mind if we... I'm going to stop the recording.